of the time, or has been on most of the time. Uh, it's just that I didn't speak. Yes, I'm talking. I feel so much better now that I added it. I added it to class. I would love to be in class.
the position of the carbonyl. So in glucose, you only see the ring structure, and in the ring structure, there's no carbonyl. But in the open form of glucose, there is a carbonyl, and that carbonyl is the aldehyde. And the aldehyde is at uh, the first carbon, which of course would be C1. The way that the uh, in glycolysis you break it up is you do, in effect, a retroaldol. And when you do a retroaldol, what happens is you're going to cleave the bond not uh, between the alpha and beta carbons. And if you did that in glucose, you get pieces that are 2 and 4. And then you'd have to have a metabolism for the 2 piece and a metabolism for the 4 piece. And so that would make life complex. So what the body wants to do is it wants to shift that carbonyl group from the 1 position to the 2 position. So when you do the retroaldol, you get three, two 3 carbon pieces. Because if you have two three carbon pieces, then you only are okay? going to go and use those three carbon pieces, and you can have one metabolic pathway for those three carbon pieces, which is going to make things simpler. So the next few steps involve moving the position of the carbonyl group. So that way, you can go and, in effect, move it from the one position to the two position. So in glucose, the carbonyl is at position number one, and that's right there. However, if you go and I summarize it to fructose, the carbonyl now becomes at position two. And please note what they show there is the closed form. And so if you show the open form in here for glucose, you're going to get A, and then you're going to get, you know, over here. here. For on the other hand, for, um, uh oh, what did I just do? I didn't see the <laughs> and stuff there. Okay, that's fine. If, on the other hand, you're going to do it for fructose, fructose in the open form is going to look like that. And so, therefore, the carbonyl is going to go from the one position here in glucose to the two position in fructose. And so, what you have is you have an enzyme called phosphoglucoisomerase. And the reason it's called an isomerase is because what you're doing is you're going and moving the, this is a double bond, you're not changing the chemical uh, composition. So oh, glucose 6-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate are isomers of each other. And so therefore, it's called an isomerase. And so as you can see here in this picture, it's called glucose isomerase. And what it does is it goes and moves from the, uh, from the uh, one position, the carbonyl, to the two position. To make the molecule more symmetric, what you do next is you go and put a phosphate group on to the fructose 6-phosphate. And the way you do this is the same way as you did with hexokinase. You use a kinase. The kinase is named after the least phosphorylated species. So this kinase is not fructose 1,6-bisphosphate kinase. It's fructose 6-phosphate oh, kinase because it's the least phosphorylated species. You're transferring a phosphate group from an ATP. And so therefore, now you make the molecule reasonably symmetric, not perfectly symmetric, but reasonably symmetric. So phosphofructokinase, what it does is it goes, I don't know if black is okay, phosphofructokinase, what it does is it goes and transfers a phosphate group onto the fructose 6-phosphate. You make fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. I should point out that phosphofructokinase also is abbreviated PFK, and PFK is the site of regulation for um, glycolysis normally. And the reason for that is that um, glucose 6-phosphate is used for other things, such as making glycogen. And so if you regulated hexokinase, that would be a problem. And if you regulate the isomerase, that would also be a problem because it's pretty much in equilibrium. It's not a very thermodynamically favorable reaction. So the site of regulation is really phosphofructokinase, and when we talk about regulation, we'll see that in a lot of places, So we'll see that quite a bit. Now you get the fun step. What happens next is you use an enzyme called aldolase. What aldolase does is it does, in this direction, it does what they call a retroaldol reaction. 
And in the retroaldol reaction, it breaks the six carbon molecule down into two, three carbon molecules. And so when it breaks it down, it does, as I'm sure you're all familiar with from organic chemistry, the retroaldol. And so here you get dihydroxyacetone phosphate, which is a ketone, and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which is an aldehyde. And again, we'll go into this in more detail, and we'll take a look at the mechanism. But in this case, the idea is you go from six carbons to two, three carbon pieces. These two, three carbon pieces can go back and forth. Again, they're very similar to what happened with glucose 6-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate. One is an aldehyde, the other one is a ketone. So they both have the same molecular formula. The enzyme is in isomerase. And then isomerase is between the two. This is called triosphosphate isomerase, TPI, or people sometimes call it TIM. I don't know. TIM sounds better than TPI, so that's why people, I guess, chose TIM. But uh, the book, uh, uh, most people refer to it as TPI. But you also sometimes see it as TIM. Um, once you get there, we have glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So up to now, uh, uh, TPI is triose phosphate isomerase, and so that's this particular, this one here. And so that's where we're at now. So up to this point here, all we've done is consume two ATPs. And so in terms of getting energy out, consuming two ATPs is not something that's very favorable. And so therefore, what we have to do now is figure out how we're gonna get some energy or some ATP out of this. So therefore it doesn't cost us ATP to do this ultimately. And so what happens here is through the use of oxidation, we're able to, in effect, generate enough energy to go and produce ATP. And please remember in the second stage that I show you here is done twice for every glucose molecule, and so therefore twice for every glucose molecule. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go and take a look at uh, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. In this enzyme here, what happens is you do an oxidation reaction, and so you oxidize the aldehyde shown here to a carboxylic acid, and so that is an oxidation reaction. And generally, that's energetically favorable. And in the same process, as you do the oxidation reaction, you go and spray A. And it's important to remember the molecules per glucose because you're transferring the, or the hydrogen from the aldehyde over to the NADH, or NAD to make NADH. In addition, you take inorganic phosphate and you make an phosphate. So in this process here, you make a high-energy phosphate, the acyl phosphate, and you oxidize carbon. The energy used to oxidize carbon is used to make a high-energy phosphate. After you, ha you have the high-energy phosphate, yay! Now we can go and make what? With the high-energy phosphate, you can go and make ATP. That's right. Yay! ATP. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to go and make some ATP. And the way that we go and make ATP is we have another kinase. And that's called phosphoglycerate kinase. And again, the kinase is named after the least phosphorylated species. Although that may seem to make the reaction go backwards. Because which is less phosphorylated? 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate or 3-phosphoglycerate? Clearly, it's going to be the 3-phosphoglycerate, which only has one phosphate. 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate has two. So this kinase is named after the least phosphorylated species, so it's called a phosphoglycerate kinase. And it transfers a phosphate group from the bisphosphoglycerate to ADP to make ATP. And so although it seems to be named backwards, it's not actually named backwards. They're always named after the least phosphorylated species. So now you've made ATP. because you do this twice for every glucose molecule. 
And so therefore, you consume two ATPs at the top, you've now produced two ATPs, your net ATP production is now zero. So okay, so you've done a lot, but yet you've got nothing out yet. So how are we going to get something out of here? Well, the next few steps are ones that you're going to see um, also in fatty acid metabolism when you go there. But what happens here is you're going to go and do a uh, phosphoglycerate mutase. What happens with phosphoglycerate mutase is you go and you move the position of the phosphate group from the three position to the two position. You might think this is going to be called an isomerase. In theory, it could. But an enzyme that goes and isomerizes phosphate groups happens in a special name called butase. The enzymes that isomerize phosphate groups are called butases. And so this is called phosphoglycerate butase because the phosphate group goes from being in the three position to being in the two position. So it's called phosphoglycerate butase. After that, your next one is called enolase. And enolase is really just a fancy name for an enzyme that causes you to lose water. It's a dehydration reaction. That's so what enolase does is it catalyzes the dehydration of 2-phosphoglycerate to make phosphoenopyruvate, or PEP. And so people usually call this PEP, phosphoenopyruvate. And now, the reason that you've done this is that the phosphate group in 2-phosphoglycerate is not very high energy. And it's going to be very hard to make ATP from it. But by doing this dehydration, you generate this phosphoenopyruvate, which has a very high energy phosphate. And with the high energy phosphate, of course, you can go and make what? Energy phosphates let you make, yay, ATP, bingo. Yeah, everybody's getting it this time. That's good. So you're getting ATP. And so therefore, what happens here is you're going to make ATP. And so that's going to be catalyzed by an enzyme called pyruvate kinase. Again, it's called the kinase because it transfers a phosphate group to or from, uh, mm. transfer group from ATP or to ADP. And it's named after the least phosphorylated species. Again, we have pyruvate or phosphenopyruvate. The least phosphorylated species, of course, is going to be pyruvate. And so the enzyme is called pyruvate kinase. And at this point here, I want to highlight, you finally get paid with two ATPs. And so the idea here is that overview is that you start with a six carbon species, you break it down into two, two carbon species, you oxidize the two carbon species a little bit, and ultimately you get out ATP. The other thing that's very important about this process to appreciate is that you, yes, you get, uh, sorry, two, three carbon pieces, that's right. Um, and so the other thing to appreciate here is that this does not involve oxygen. And therefore, it is called anaerobic. And it turns out that glycolysis is especially important in cancer cells, in part because it's very hard for cancer cells to get oxygen. So things that target uh, glycolysis have the potential to, in effect, slow down the growth of tumors. On the other hand, you also need glycolysis for the rest of your body to function, so you do need it to function at some uh, level. And that's glycolysis. And so please note anaerobic, because uh, glucose is going to, in effect, pyruvate, and in 10 steps. Please know uh, and be able to draw all these intermediates, and please know uh, the enzymes and the names of the intermediates. So there are 11 intermediates, if you include glucose and pyruvate in this, and there are 10 steps. Again, know the steps, know the intermediates. Uh, yes, my understanding is that mature red blood cells do go, uh, do undergo glycolysis. Um, and so therefore, what happens here um, is what we're going to do now is we're going to go 
and try a new thing here. We're going to go and try breakout rooms based upon your tables. So when you try breakout rooms, the person that's going to take over is going to be your uh, LA. And so what we're going to do here is I'm just going to go back and do one quick thing here. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go through this glycolysis worksheet. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through all the way to item number K. So please go and work through item number K with your, um, yes, all enzymes and intermediates. Uh, item number K with your uh, LAs. And let's see if I can get this to work. I don't know how well it's going to work, but let's see if we can do this. Okay, uh, let's see. I guess we can do that. Okay, fine. That's two. Okay. So let's go for it now. Hello? Hi, I can hear you. I just can't see you. Oh. Hi, I can hear you. Just can't see you. All right. Yeah, I don't have my camera on. Hello, okay. everyone. How are you guys doing? Yeah. Yeah, pretty good. All right, so I'll just put that there. Oh, cool. Hey, yeah, so we're basically going to be working on the glycolysis worksheet. So if you guys have any questions, if you want to get a head start, and then we could probably like reconvene at like, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, see where you guys are. And if you have any questions, you can always just pop in in the group chat or you could just ask me directly. Sounds good. All right. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Give me one second. Um, you can't find it through Canvas? <laughs> All right, yeah, I'll put it. Give me one second. <laughs> No. No. Yes. 
Always. They can smell what Sarasi is cooking. How long do we have in the breakout room? Yes, probably, probably until like noon, maybe. I'm I don't know if he will reconvene or not, but yeah, so far probably until noon. Uh, but I'll double check for you guys. Let me just pull it out here. Mm, so good. All right. Here's the worksheet, can you see it? Okay. Um, I want to give you guys some time to work through it first, and then we can go through it together. Would, does that sound good, Kelsey? <laughs> this is funny this group chat is so funny because there's a group chat connected to it yeah sure um thing is if let me let me see something. I right here. <laughs> yeah, I want everyone else. Has everyone else had a chance to go through it? Halfway through, okay. Yeah, I, I read through it but I didn't answer anything. I just wanted to be prepared for the questions that were asked. Oh yeah, it moves. All right, um, William, just give me one second. I'll open the worksheet in a different way so that I can write on it. Thank you, Lovey. Yes, um, we're planning on working on it together so that you guys don't feel like we're going through it too fast. Just give me one second. Mm. Or should I just oh my God, this is so good. All right, can you guys see the worksheet? Oh, I can see it. Either. Okay. Yep, I love that app too. <laughs> it's just that when I'm here, I can't see the chat. Let me see right here. All right, so I'll give you guys like 10 minutes. So, to like, 
40, 45, and then we can work on it. Does that sound good? I think it does. Are you sure it doesn't? There you are. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. But, yeah. So for number one, would that be like the reactions? Because there's a table in page 462 that has like reactions of glycolysis and then so it's like steps. I mean, number A is just asking me how many steps there are. So they're just a number. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's just 10. Okay. Yep. Yeah. But it's specifically, it is those uh, steps in the table. William, can you see it like that? Or do you want I'm going to enlarge it. Okay. So, I mean, I'll just do it through Zoom for this for now. And then when we go over it, I'll switch to the notability. tried making it split screen for some reason it wouldn't let me and let me see
be working in the country. Oh, I, I I muted myself for a second there. Can you hear me, Nicole? Yep, one more, you're right. So basically, um, if you go through the steps, you'll notice fructose one six this phosphate um, becomes GAP, glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Um, yeah. But then like when it goes through just glycerol the high three phosphate, it produces an ATP of two. But then it also produces DAP, dihydroxyacetyl phosphate. And when that can be converted back to the glycerol the high three phosphate and go through that same process. And that's why it's a net of four, not just two. And we'll go over it. Um, I'll, I'll draw it out um, when it's time. So would V, sorry, would, so would V be two net ATP production? I said that earlier, I just didn't know. I um, was right. for, for B, yes. For glucose, it's two. Okay. But for fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, it's four. Because for every glycerol that three phosphate, it produces a net ATP of two. But fructose 1,6-bisphosphate produces the G3 um, gap, and DHAP. DHAP can then be converted back to GAP. So instead of just having two, you'd have four. It's like having two G3Ps for every one fructose 1,6 phosphate. So B, it's two, but for C, it's four. That makes sense. Well, actually, it's going through the steps that would help. So this is where, like, for instance, our worksheet, you want to go through the entire steps. But yeah, we can we can go over it. Uh, let me see the here glucose. Okay, you guys have five more minutes. So if you guys want, so we have five more minutes before we convene back. Do you guys feel like we could go over it now or do you want some more time? I mean, 
it. We can do until where you are so far. Because in five more minutes, we're convening back. Or what is Gustavo saying? Oh, okay. Alright, until which question have you guys topped? Yeah, I read that. Um, E? Okay. Okay, because uh, let me just tell you, let's just quickly go over A through D, and then I'll let you guys continue finishing up. Does that sound good? Okay. All right, so how many steps are in glycolysis? Mm -hmm. Ten. That should be a given. I'm going to write more. Ten. And then... What is the action of ATP per glucose molecule for glycolysis? So for this one here, what I guys, what I highly recommend is making your own or looking at the pathway or making your own pathway of glycolysis. So let me quickly show you guys something. Oh my god. That, it just told me, it's like, you're muted. No one can hear you. Yep, you use up to ATP and you use your hexakinase and first of all, kinase, what you produce for. So I highly suggest when you're studying for glycolysis, just make sure to write down all the steps. Yep, for B, it is done. But why is it for C, it's four? So let me quickly show you guys something. Which is what I was mentioning earlier. So can you guys see this pathway here? So this is pretty much my own notes for glycolysis, a very crude one. Um, I, I put the structures in another place. But what I was trying to show you guys is, this is where glucose starts, right? If you notice, it used up one ATP, ATP here, another ATP here, right? And then if you look over here where it has fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, right? It produces G3P and DHAP. But if you notice, they're interconvertible. Like, like you can convert DHATP to G3P, which is why, so per G3P, if you notice this arrow there, times two. If you guys want, you can chime in using the audio because I can't see the group chat. But um, if you notice, times two. So per G3 molecule, you use one ATP, two ATPs. But because DHAP can be converted to G3P over here, it's times two. So it actually becomes a net production of four, net loss of two here. So the net per glucose is four minus two, which is two. That's for B. Mm. Is everyone able to say it for B? Uh, yeah, I was able to see that. Okay. Yep. Now, here's the thing. C is asking you uh, net production per fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So per fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is basically in that orange step here. So this is where you look at it. And if you notice, it's a net of four. And that's it. So that's why for C it's four, but for B it's two. 
because for glucose, you're taking in steps one, two, and three. But for fructose one six bisphosphate, it's only these steps right there. And just by looking at the steps, you're able to figure that out. And then going through D, what is the net production of ATP per molecule of G3P? Right? So if fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, you mentioned it, it creates how many G3Ps in total? By the way, he's going to end the session in 30 seconds, it says. Oh, 30 seconds? All right, then. Well, if you notice in G3P, it's only half of that, so it's only two, basically. That was really helpful, though. Sounds good. So just go through the pathway, and you'll be able to figure it out. So you were saying that D is two? Hmm? D is how and many? D is only two. Okay. All right. for uh, the particular uh, glycolysis. So shown here is the overall reaction for glycolysis. And again, the thing to highlight here is, uh oh, you can't see anything. Oh. Because I didn't turn it on right. Uh, let's see what I can do. Um, hopefully you can see the, the screen now. Okay, good. So what we're going to do now is go and continue on with glycolysis. And shown here is the overall reaction for glycolysis. And what you notice here, first of all, is there's no oxygen is required, which is good. Because again, a lot of this takes place under anaerobic conditions. You also note that overall you produce two ATPs, uh, which is energy, which is important. And in addition, you produce two NADHs. And the issue with producing two NADHs will need to be addressed later because you only have so much NAD in your body. So some way you need a way of recycling that NADH back to NAD so it can be used again and glycolysis can continue. And we'll discuss how the NADH goes back to NAD in a few minutes. Uh, here's just the overall about glycolysis taking place in the absence of oxygen. Um, why glycolysis? Well, probably glucose was formed under prebiotic conditions because it's the most stable sugar. And so there, as all the hydroxyls can be equatorial in the beta anomer. And so therefore, you had glucose around, so therefore, that's why it started to go and work. Shown here is just the idea that you go from glucose to pyruvate. And what happens in order to go and recirculate that NADH is the pyruvate either goes on to lactate or it goes on to ethanol, which is fermentation, and that's how the NADH goes um, from being, in effect, uh, produced during glycolysis to being consumed. So under anaerobic conditions, your muscles produce lactic acid because the pyruvate is converted to lactate, and therefore, uh, through reduction and through the regeneration conversion of NADH to NAD, inside yeast, they produce um, alcohol, which we're all very familiar with. Um, 
The first issue that we haven't addressed yet is that glucose uh, transporters are important. It's very important for glucose to get it inside the cells. Shown here are five different glucose transporters. Uh, you'll notice that the KM values vary quite dramatically. The ones that are highest are for the liver and the pancreatic beta cells. That's because when you have very high uh, glucose concentrations, that's where your glucose goes. One is to be able to sense how much glucose there is so it can go and produce uh, you know, insulin and uh, such, and that would be the pancreatic beta cells. The liver is where they build up glycogen and your sugars are stored. So therefore, a high sugar concentration, the liver is gonna suck up more sugar. Uh, most other things have a relatively lower KM, one or five millimolar, and that's just going and taking up glucose from the blood to go and survive. Um, here, what we do quickly is go through the steps of glycolysis. Um, hexokinase is shown here. That's the first step. We mentioned already that it goes and puts the phosphate group on glucose so that the glucose doesn't leave the cell because now it's ionic. Um, this requires magnesium. Most enzymes that have ATP require magnesium. So there's nothing special here. It also reacts where it works with other six carbon sugars. That's why it's called hexokinase, hexose kinase, uh, but, uh, and not glucose kinase. Although there is actually a glucose kinase, which we will discuss later on. The way that this enzyme works is interesting. What happens is because you don't want the water to react with, the, um, with it directly, what happens is you need to go and uh, you need to go and when you need to go and have an enzyme such that when the glucose binds the enzyme, it changes its conformation so that that way only after it binds the glucose can it hydrolyze ATP. Because you don't want these enzymes hydrolyzing ATP in the absence of their substrates because hydrolysis of ATP in the absence of glucose would just create heat, and that would not be very good for the body in general. And so therefore what happens here is the glucose binds, it exposes its uh, OH group, the 6OH, and therefore then ATP can bind and go and work. And so what you see here is in the blue one, structure is the absence of glucose, red is the presence of glucose, and so you only form the complete active site once the glucose is bad. And this is true for a lot of kinases. And so therefore, you're gonna go and see that. Mm. Um, and so therefore, that's gonna be a problem. Are you finished? And so therefore, here's the next enzyme in the pathway, phosphoglucoisomerase. What this enzyme does is it takes the glucose 6-phosphate, it opens it up into the open chain form where you have the aldehyde. The aldehyde then goes and gets isomerized over to the ketone, shown here. So you go from the carbonyl at C1 over the carbonyl at C2. Once you've done that, this then closes. <clears throat> and so the enzyme opens it up, isomerizes it, and then it goes and gets closed. And again, this is so the carbonyl moves from the one position to the two position. And you can see that here, this is position one, this is position two. Um, after that, you do phosphofructokinase. Phosphofructokinase goes and puts an ATP on the one position of fructose to make fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. This reaction is very favorable. Thermodynamically, it lies to the right side. And this helps it in being a key enzyme in the regulation of glycolysis. And so this enzyme really plays a central role in metabolism. And so we're gonna go and see it again, over and over and over again. Shown here is aldolase. Aldolase is, in effect, catalyzes an aldol condensation. But the aldol condensation would be the reaction going from right to left, because this is going from left to right. 
is called a retro aldol. Retro meaning backwards. And so the retro aldol reaction goes and produces dihydroxyisoprene phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. So it goes and produces two three carbon fragments. One, two, three. One, two, three from a six carbon sugar. So you produce two three carbon sugars. Um, what happens uh, from there uh, is that um, the red part comes from the red part and the blue part comes from the blue part. So they're kind of linked together. Uh, the other thing about these two, as we'll show you in the next uh, few slides, is that they are interchangeable. And so you can go from the aldehyde to the ketone or back and forth as the case may be. And this here, again, is an aldol reaction. I would encourage you just to quickly go back, review your organic chemistry, see what an aldol reaction is, so you can understand what a retro aldol reaction is. But here, the bond that's being cleaved is this black bond here. What's important is this black bond is alpha beta to this carbonyl group here. So retro aldols cleave the alpha beta carbon carbon bonds next to carbonyls. If you did this for glucose, of course, you would end up with two three carbon pieces. You'd end up with a two carbon and a four carbon piece because the carbonyl glucose is not at the two position, but at the one position. And so the alpha beta bond for glucose would not be in the same place as it is here. It would be shifted by one carbon. So here is TPI, TIM, or triosphosphate isomerase. Again, at equilibrium, this is 96% in terms of the ketone. But inside the body, there happens to be a lot of dihydroxyisoprene phosphate and not so much glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And it turns out that you keep on removing the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So slowly, the dihydroxyisoprene, well, not slowly, but relatively quickly, the dihydroxyisoprene phosphate goes over to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and then uh, goes on to the rest of glycolysis. And so this here just goes from the carbonyl at this, oh, why is that wrong? Carbonyl at C2 to carbonyl at C1. And then you can use this one here on the right side for the rest of glycolysis and go on from there. So here is the structure of TPI. In the case of TPI, what you'll notice here is that the uh, enzyme is what they call an alpha beta barrel. It's called an alpha beta barrel because, surprise, surprise, it looks like a barrel. And it has a, in effect, beta sheet in the middle. And then on the outside, it has these alpha helices. And so this makes it what they call an alpha beta barrel. This is a common structural motif that you see. And so therefore, uh, this is how the enzyme structure looks. The active side of the enzyme, of course, is only a small, small portion of this alpha beta barrel. Shown here is the mechanism for triose phosphate isomerase. And yes, we expect you guys to know the mechanisms. In this case here, what happens is you, first of all, remove the hydrogen from dihydroxyacetone. That makes it a enol or enediol. This enediol, and it's called enediol because it has a double bond here. Double bond being enediol here because it has two H groups. So it's what they call enediol immediate. And so you have your enediol. This enediol then transfers a proton over to a histidine. This histidine then. Uh, in effect, makes the anion. This anion then goes and reorganizes to generate the corresponding aldehyde. And this is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. The one thing I want to point out here is that enzymes catalyze the reaction in both directions. So the mechanism in the forward direction is going to be the same as the mechanism in the backward direction. The states are going to be reversed, however. Um, and so, therefore, this is what's going to happen. Uh, do you need to know the structures of the reagents slash enzymes? This, again, this yellow portion is the enzyme. So this would be the actual enzyme itself. Uh, generally, we just ask that you put a base and an acid. 
but if you want to draw the whole thing, that would be very uh, helpful. And so that would certainly look better in terms of drawing the actual enzyme uh, structure. Shown here is the idea of this ene dial intermediate that we discussed. If you did this, made this ene dial in the solution, it would automatically lose the phosphate. But in the enzyme active site, the enzyme keeps it in such a conformation that you can't actually lose the phosphate. So this ene dial Ene diol intermediate is stable on the enzyme, but it's not stable in solution. So again, this highlights the fact that enzymes keep the intermediates in certain conformations that do not allow side reactions. And we saw this with hemoglobin and oxygen binding. Uh, and here we see this with an enzymatic reaction, again, where you need to keep it in a certain conformation or it's not going to work. You're going to have problems with side reactions. shown here, and that covers the first part of glycolysis. What we're going to do now is take a quick look at the second part of glycolysis. Uh, shown here is the second part. In this case here, you have glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. It's going to go and And so here what happens is we have glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Uh, we have NAD. Again, happens here. You go and oxidize the carbon from the um, aldehyde, aldehyde to the carboxylic acid. And so in this case here, what happens is you also make a high-energy phosphate bond. In addition here, what we do see is the two reactions. One is to make this high energy oxidation reaction to go and oxidize from the from the um, aldehyde to the carboxylic acid. That's oxidation. That's very favorable. However, going and making the acyl phosphate is thermodynamically unfavorable. And so we have a reaction that's thermodynamically favorable, and we have a reaction that's uh, and we have uh, a very unfavorable reaction. And so clearly you have to have some way of coupling these two processes so that way you get ultimately a favorable reaction. And you could do this by doing the two separate reactions, or if you did the two separate reactions, you would end up in a big thermodynamic sink shown here. And that would not be very good. So what you need to do is come up with a way whereby you make everything pretty much isoenergetic. And the way that the enzyme does that is through what they call a thiol ester intermediate. And shown here is the thiol ester intermediate. This allows it to go and not get caught in a big thermodynamic hole, which will be very hard and very slow to get out of. And the way it does that is with this thiol ester. The enzyme contains a cysteine group in the active site that goes and attacks that cysteine group here, goes and attacks the carbonyl of the aldehyde. This then goes and makes what they call a hemithioacetal. It's called a hemithioacetal because it's a acetal. However, half of it is a sulfur, so it's a hemithioacetal. Once you get the hemithioacetal, you then transfer the hydride from the hemithioacetal over to NAD. NAD is shown here. This is NAD plus to go and make NADH. The NADH then, in effect, can now go away and another NAD plus binds. This loss of NADH and binding of NAD plus is important because the NAD plus helps to activate this carbonyl here. As you know, if you go and put a positive charge next to a carbonyl, it's going to make it more reactive. That's because you stabilize the negative charge on the oxygen. And so therefore, here, this now allows the phosphate to go, inorganic phosphate, to go and attack and displace the thioacetal to make the corresponding acyl phosphate. And again, this 
is a reaction that works well. And again, please understand that this mechanism is something that you need to know. You need to appreciate the sulfur here, and you need to create the base here, and you need to, again, understand NAD and NADH. Ultimately, in the last part, the last two reactions, you're going to get paid with ATP for the first time. And this is where you get the net production of two ATP per glucose uh, per glucose. Um, until you get here, there's no net production of ATP. And so in this case here, what happens is you go and um, try, you go and first you have phosphoglycerate kinase. And so here you transfer the phosphate group from here over to ADP to make ATP, this high energy phosphate. And so therefore you get the net production of two ATPs per glucose. This means overall there's no net production. You put two ATPs in to make the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and now you're no longer doing that. And so the idea here is this ACO phosphate is a high energy phosphate that can go and work well. Um, the last couple of steps here, uh, the last two steps, what happens here is that oxidation of the aldehyde to the carboxylic acid has resulted in energy being produced. This also leads to NAD being converted to NADH and also the production of ATP at the expense of carbon oxidation. And so therefore, we need to know carbon oxidation. Here's two additional ATP glucoses are gonna be produced per glucose. And this is the last few steps. Here we have phosphoglycerate mutase. What phosphoglycerate mutase does is it goes and moves the phosphate group from the three position over to the two position. You then get dehydration. So you go and lose water. And let me show you the water here. So you're gonna go and lose water, OH, H, that's going to be water, that's going to be lost, and you're going to end up with a double bond. The reason you want to do this is that the energy of the phosphate here and here are not very high for 3-phospho or 2-phosphoglycerate, but it is much higher for PEP. The energy of the phosphate in PEP is enough to produce ATP, while that in 3-phosphoglycerate and 2-phosphoglycerate is not. And so that's the advantage of doing these last few steps. Um, the mechanism of phosphoglycerate mutase is shown here. In this particular case here, what happens is you have 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate as a cofactor. And so 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, which you've seen before, um, is used as a cofactor. And so this here happens to go interact with the enzyme. It makes a phosphate enzyme intermediate and 2-phosphoglycerate. You then bind 3-phosphoglycerate to the enzyme, and you go back and remake the 2-3-phosphoglycerate. So overall, you're going to summarize 3-phosphoglycerate to 2-phosphoglycerate. Lastly, you dehydrate the um, using enolase to phosphonopyruvate. The reason phosphonopyruvate is such a high energy partial transfer donor is that when you lose the phosphate you create the enol form and we know that uh, enol forms are less stable than keto forms so then you get enol keto tomerization this drives the reaction forward and makes pp a very high energy uh, phosphate donor and so therefore that's what's going on here uh, lastly um, Uh, oh, the lecture should be posted on Canvas as well. Um, uh, the last lecture was posted on Canvas as well. Lastly, mm -hmm. please uh, take a look here. Uh, and so see what's going on. We see here the 10 steps of glycolysis. We see the various energies. And my time is up for today. So next class, 
we will go and discuss this and then we will go on and take a look at uh, the regulation of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. Thank you all again very much for participating today. Make sure that you guys stay healthy and I understand that it's getting more and more challenging to do so. So please try and look after yourself because ultimately that's more important even than this biochemistry. I know I shouldn't say that, but please make sure you look after yourselves. Okay? And thank you all very much. And we'll see you guys uh, on Thursday. And have a great two days. Thank you.